So today we're going to talk about advocacy, how it affects our specialty. So uh, no conflicts of interest. I'm passionate and involved. Uh, I'm first vice president for SOAP and a member of the ASA task force on out of network. Most people think advocacy is something like this. You know, Zeus throws a lightning bolt down to Congress and they pass some bill. It's not quite that easy. So right, what, what's the basic that you or I as a practitioner want, right? You want to help people show up to work, do a good job, have a pleasant environment, and kind of minimize the distractions um, and hassles from work. Except we have all these external forces trying to intervene in what we do, right? There's an alphabet soup of regulatory agencies in California. We have Department of Health, Department of Insurance, Department of Managed Healthcare. Federal level, you've got uh, Medicare, Joint Commission, FDA. Anytime there's a problem that pops up politically, what do they do? They, have, they fix it and they tell you how to practice medicine. <clears throat> and it's even more complicated nowadays because they're trying to incentivize you and encourage behavior and tying it to payment. So it's no longer, oh, you just do a cesarean, but did you do all the metrics? And there's another alphabet soup there that keeps changing, macro, MIPS, you know, now pri private insurers uh, are getting into it, and even the, even the state in terms of, we're not gonna contract with your hospital for labor uh, if you don't meet certain benchmarks. In particular, the one they're looking at is the cesarean section rate on the NTSV, the nulliparous term singleton vertex women. So, right, uh, we went to school, we learned pharmacology, physiology, you know, what are the best medical practices, uh, how to get good operating conditions for the obstetrician, how to provide the patient with good pain relief. We're always looking for the, kind of that sweet spot but it got more complicated. Patient satisfaction became a big deal because they tied, Medicare started to tie payments for it once they start the private insurers. Uh, this actually came out in the ASA monitor yesterday, but now it's no longer just satisfaction. It has to do with the whole patient experience. What happens to them before they come to the hospital, in the hospital, when they leave the hospital, uh, their hospital systems are trying to build their brand and build brand loyalty just like any other widget or service you want to sell. So, right, if someone wants a labor epidural, for instance, how soon should you be there? So that gets, it's not directly related to some of the other uses of immediately available, but how many, raise your hand, how many thinks immediately available means you have to be there in one minute? Okay, nobody, how about five minutes? We got to buy a couple buyers there, 10. Okay, starting to warm up here, 15. And what about 30? Okay, so 30 minute was that old, which I would argue is no longer current, the ACOG decision to incision time limit for doing a cesarean. But the reality is ASA has been very careful not to put an absolute number because when you do that, someone's gonna get caught. Um, right, so immediately availability has to do with reestablishing direct contact and meeting the medical needs and address any urgent or emergent clinical problems. And it's very hard to say, oh, it's X minutes or you have to be within, you know, 100 yards of labor and delivery. You know, there's such a variety as I've learned in my various roles coming up through CSA, legislation and practice affairs, uh, different committees and SOAP at ASA. I mean, you have rural access hospitals, critical care hospitals. <clears throat> I work in a large place, so it's easier to do some of this stuff, but you can't, it's very hard to come up with a benchmark that works across all of those spectrums. And that's why the definition is um, a little vague because, you know, uh, if you're a hospital doing Suppose you're a critical care rural access hospital. You're not, you can't have someone there 24-7 dedicated to OB anesthesia services if you do, you know, 50 deliveries a year. All right, so it comes down to sort of time versus money. What's the volume? How can you staff it? 
So today in 2017, what do we all need to be focused on? It's more, it's not about us. It is uh, about, you know, patient care for sure, but it goes beyond that. You have to think about how can I help the system? How can I help the hospital? How can I help them retain their customer base by having a good patient experience? How can I institute good policies that help to protect patients and improve outcomes, as well as just sort of being efficient? The buzzword I've been hearing the last year, a couple years, going around to the various venues I do uh, is population health. And some of the insurers and the states, when they're talking, how do we ensure, you know, a couple million people in the state, the, the buzzword is population health. So uh, Tip O'Neill first said, all politics is local. I would extend that down to the hospital level where everyone, all the hospital politics are local. So you have to stay engaged to affect what's going on. So, right, moderate sedation is not really considered anesthesia, and it is allowed to be given by licensed professionals. It can be delegated or supervised. Um, and I would re remind everyone, if you haven't read it recently, the definitions for moderate sedation is their purposeful response to, for what we would consider sort of mild verbal or tactile stimulation, like, hey, what buddy, wake up, open your eyes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the ASA definition, right, of deep sedation, general anesthesia, it's a continuum, and we've all been there where it's very easy. Uh, for instance, you're in the GI lab, uh, patient's moving, they want some more, you give a little more, and you're going from moderate to deep into general anesthesia. So a qualified anesthesia provider, right, anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, but it does include some physicians who are not in that category, as well as oral surgeons and some dentists. So here's where regulation really does affect your practice. How many here feel that just a regular RN is really qualified and it's safe to give deep sedation? Anybody? Okay, let the record show no one in this room has raised their hand. Uh, yet it is, they're trying to do that in many states. The GI people were trying to do it in terms of, well, I don't need to get an anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist, let's just, the nurse will give it by infusion with the, with the fancy machine or not, you know, uh, it'll be cheaper, but that's not really allowed. You have to be able to rescue from one level deeper as we all know, as patients slip easily from deep into general anesthesia. Um, I fought with uh, the Department of California Department of Health actually had put out an all, facility le all facilities letter a couple years ago that was requested on behalf of the California Hospital Association, I believe, and in essence it would have allowed them to let the nurses administer or monitor deep sedation either in the ER or other places, and I had to go through a lot of effort to educate them and convince them otherwise, and then they reversed that. Um, respiratory therapists, how many people think respiratory therapists should be getting it, are qualified, or should be getting into the business of giving anesthesia? Okay, once again, nobody's raising their hand. Well, didn't know to look for it. There was a bill about respiratory therapy that was supposed to sort of be a cleanup and make them more of a team member and they snuck the word anesthesia in the stuff that they could give. Once again, I had to go to the Department of Health and write a nice long letter saying, ex explaining why CMS does not allow uh, respiratory therapists to administer anesthesia. So things that you would not even have thought of before you came into this room this morning are important to you and your practice. Right? ER physicians are trained in airway management as our oral surgeons, and they are allowed to give deep sedation general anesthesia. But <clears throat> if you're going to do the procedure and you're the only one in the room who's adequately trained and licensed to administer it, can you really focus on both? I mean, I think that's a common sense thing, which does anyone think someone can really focus on both? I know we're on the anesthesia administration side. I don't see anyone voting for the, what's called the single operator anesthetist model. Um, and I've, this, 
during, uh, I'm three quarters of the way through my presidency for the California Society, and I've spent an enormous amount of time on this issue in terms of pediatric dental sedation following some, some deaths. But anyway, deep sedation, right? A non-anesthesiologist physician may neither delegate nor supervise the administration or monitoring of deep sedation by individuals who are not themselves qualified and trained to administer deep sedation or rescue from general anesthesia. So that sort of sets the tone. Okay, so advocacy, as I've mentioned, it's not just at the federal capital level or the state capital. There are regulatory agencies that interpret the will of the legislature. There's the professional society, but I would bring it back down and say you gotta watch and advocate for your specialty in obstetric anesthesiology practices at the hospital level and even how you interact with patients matters. Right, we show up to work nowadays, there are too many rules. Oh, you can't, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Make sure you click 10 different things in the electronic medical record to prove that you did it, but that takes time and focus away from what you really wanna do, which is taking care of the patient. So I say other people rules, while they have good intentions, there's the hassle factor, it can lead to multitasking and ultimately I think decrease patient safety even though the ultimate goal by some regulator or somebody else who doesn't work in our field, you know, thinks it's, it's a good idea and will improve things, right? <clears throat> we would hope that they make a true systems analysis for what's the goal, the risk benefit, the cost, either in terms of equipment, time, you know, like I said, there's hassle factor, focus factor, but it affects our daily lives, right? What's the workflow? How much time do I have to spend documenting on the computer um, and things that take time and the incentives they put in for patient safety or might change the patient experience, you know, directly and indirectly affects your income and the ability to take care of patients. One of the fundamentals is um, underfunding of Medi-Cal or Medi Medicaid outside of California. Um, and the government's the only one who can tell you you're required to do X, Y, and Z, but they don't have to give you the means to do it. So hospitals generally, right, they want 24-7 coverage of labor and delivery services, but there's a big gap between the resources they give you and then the wants, needs, and the regulatory aspects. Here's an example of bad hospital policy. Um, back in, I don't know if you remember, 1998 in Northridge, there was a big to-do. It was actually the hospital was charging Medi-Cal patients for labor epidurals. Of course, bad policy leads to bad PR. The hospital achieved national and international attention. Um, here, that led to legislation. The fees for Medi-Cal are pathetically low, but the human factor is also significant, you know, that they made a poor public policy decision. I would argue it's not the individual, certainly, who made the public policy decision. It was the legislature in terms of, oh, provide services and not supporting for it. But they come in and they do a fix and they say, you must provide the service. And at the time, they did throw in a little bit of extra money for uh, Medi-Cal epidurals, which at that time, I had just joined the board of the uh, California Society and I'd argued or suggested at the board meeting that, oh, why not, right? If you make it, Hassle is time, is money, effort, mental exhaustion. So I, I'd argue to go, like some states have just a flat rate for labor epidurals. Um, and I said, oh, why not just make it easier and not have to document the face-to-face -face time that we do in California. Um, I didn't win that argument, but that's okay. Hmm. So here's a new way to think about some of what's going on today, and of course, uh, Obviously, the president changed and some of the philosophy changed, and we don't know what changes are going to come. But uh, private versus public sector. So traditionally, we think about, oh, people have insurance, but it's really uh, private health insurance, right? Employers provide the insurance or people buy. That's maybe 130 million people in the US today. But the government also provides health insurance coverage for a huge number of people. Um, have Medicare, Medicaid, and they have fundamentally different goals. So this is a new way of thinking about it. The government sector generally 
is the Medicare population, uh, which tends to be high cost per, per individual chronic illness. And they would kind of control their costs by saying, well, we're only going to pay you X. And then they were going to regulate you to make sure you do it. And then some of those accountability controls, which have, we're now seeing in terms of those um, old term, pay for performance, or we'll pay you bonus money, except you're also at risk on the quality metrics, that kind of thing. What most people don't realize is government via Medicaid program pays for almost half of the births in the United States. So they have a large say in what goes on. We're used to mostly thinking about what I call private sector or the traditional private practice model. Okay, I'm an individual, a part of a group, or part of a system, and we negotiate for services. It's sort of an uh, American free market force, uh, except as things become move from smaller practices to medium to large to national firms, things have sort of shifted. So the insurance companies are not really in the business of giving away stuff. So it's a for-profit. And right, things have shifted from PPO, preferred provider, uh, where yes, go to someone in network, but if you go to someone out of network, we'll still pay something, at least a little less, to e EPO, exclusive provider, which means you go in network, great, we'll pay, we'll pay this amount of the doctor's fee. Um, but if you go outside, we don't pay anything. So they're, they're trying to shift costs, and particularly under, um, to use the phrase, Obamacare, the insurance companies designed plans that met it, but they did it by creating narrow networks. So yeah, you can do get X, Y, and Z services, but you have to find someone on the plan but there aren't very many people on the plan. So the net effect is you kind of constrict the service, or if someone goes, it's going to be um, out of pocket. So and the insurance companies have kind of created this uh, out of network. It's not just a local problem in California. It's a national problem. Right? They'll designate a facility as in network, so the patient thinks, oh, my insurance company is sending me over here to ABC facility. Uh, so everything's covered, except the insurance company didn't contract with all the services the patient's likely to need. Like if you're going to go in for surgery or have a baby, you might need radiology, you might need pathology, you might need anesthesiology. So in particular, the hospital-based physicians were kind of forgotten about. Um, and then they, they turn around the insurance companies and they've spun it in terms of, oh, the patients are getting surprise bills. It's a surprise to the patient, I agree, because the insurance company didn't really tell them that the in-network facility would not cover all the services they would reasonably be expected to need. So they created the problem. They tried to blame the physicians. Um, but now it's everybody's problem. New York, a couple years ago, they passed a law. Um, it was hailed by the consumer groups as, oh, this is a great leap forward for the average consumer, they've been taken out of the middle. But in New York, being the first state, they did it right. They used the benchmark um, for those who are out of network, what, how much should the insurance company pay for out of network. Uh, it's called a Fair Health database. It's probably the only large database that shows uh, the actual charges. So you could argue a little bit about what's the right metric and what's the right database to use, but um, this is probably the, the, the best one and the most that reflects what's actually going on in the marketplace today. In California, for those of you who live or work here, you may have heard of AB 533. That was the first attempt in California at trying to solve the out-of-network problem. Um, and they were going to say, well, if you're out-of-network, the insurance company can pay you straight Medicare rate, and you have to accept it. You can't go after the patient. Well, that would eliminate practice as we know it today, because everyone's now being paid at Medicare, and there'd be no reason to ever contract again with you. So that was, we put a lot of work into that, and we, that got um, sidelined and killed at the very last minute, literally. Uh, and then came AB 72 last year, and I don't go into the, the deep details, but 
uh, the other network was now at 100, the higher of 125% of Medicare or average contracted rate. So again, I'm just to repeat stuff, which most of you should know, but for most medical specialties, Medicare pays at about 80% of sort of commercial rate, except for anesthesiology, which is what's been deemed the 33% problem. So they pay us at about a third of what commercial pays. So to being paid at Medicare rate or 125% of Medicare rate doesn't come even close. So the average contracted rate really was because we put a lot of effort in saying Medicare, anything pegged to Medicare doesn't work for us. And <clears throat> I am continuing to work on this problem as we uh, work with the regulatory agencies, Department of Insurance, in terms of how do you define average contracted rate and what's a fair benchmark and stuff. So I'm out there helping all of you. So wh what about regulatory? Can they help us? Well, I'd like the FDA to look yeah, see, it came out that the, the methogen print is so small it's blurry, which is, I think, how some middle-aged people find it. You have to squint a little bit. It's so small, it must be like six font size font. It's hard to read. Well, I'd like them to help us and make some standard for color coding size, um, font size. Uh, <clears throat> right? So. Joint Commission comes around and says if the syringe leaves your hand, you can draw something up, but if it leaves your hand, you have to label it. So, I mean, I get it. It makes sort of common sense, but is, a, is that true in all situations? If you're doing a spinal anesthetic and you don't <coughs> violate that little field, do you really need to label the spinal anesthetic because that's the only thing on the tray? Well, if, it, if you put it down, you do. Uh, you know, oxygen risk due to fire risk in the OR, they, right? Every case now we do an oxygen risk, so you, we stop, we pause. It's a good safety check. But, you know, are people really doing a true risk benefit cost analysis? Is there, could you use that time and energy towards something else? What's the true cost of attempting zero errors? Well, right, you, you focus on it, maybe it reduces the, the significance, the error rate some, and then they, keep upping the bar and upping the bar and you want to go to zero errors, which is great and we all want that, but what's your cost for doing it? You're going to go to uh, some asymptotic rise for cost, attention, and it's, you're going to pay the price and other things. It's like ordering too many medical tests, right? You're going to get some false negatives or false positives and take you down the wrong path. In the automobile industry, this would be the ultimate safe car, but no one's saying we should all drive a tank. So the DEA now is coming around, more regulation, right? Um, we had consultants come to, DEA consultants come to our hospital and go, oh look, Mass General paid two, over $2 million fine because they weren't tracking their narcotics right and you've got to do A, B, C, D, and A. Well, that all sounds good except then you need a full-time person just to be sitting there doing your narcotics documentation. It's getting kind of crazy. Right, so here, th because it was a, anyway, they were allowed to talk about it because the settlement was published. I think there'd be more time sort of tracking Walter White and taking care of problems that way than coming after all of us. I mean, I, I get emails, if I pull something from the Pixis, right, and you run around and you, you document it, and if I document that I gave the, the epidural fentanyl one minute before it got pulled electronically from the Pixis, I get these love mails from pharmacies saying I got to, go fix it and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, is that really where all, all our attention should be? What about something closer to your heart? Epidural connectors, right? There are, if there's a way to screw it up, somebody will. Um, so there were some events where people connected non-epidural stuff to epidurals. There are lots of case reports. I have a textbook chapter that talks about, you know, people have injected uh, thiopental, um, t they've hooked up TPN, you name it, but most of the time it's a transient neurologic symptom, if any. Uh, the only thing which permanently causes injury all the time was potassium chloride. Uh, so I get the principle and they propose changing the, the standard for the connector for both enteral food and epidural connectors to about 20% smaller. 
So in principle, right, it seems like a no-brainer, like, oh, it may change the connector, but as always, it's more complicated than it seems on the surface. So what's the true risk-benefit? Would color coding alone, mandated color coding, have worked? So these are going to be your new syringes that are coming, or some version of this where it's yellow, so you know it's epidural. California likes to be first. That's good most of the time and may not be so good some of the time. So in 2008, they passed a law saying, oh, we have to adopt this new epidural connector standard that start, and you have to do it by January 1st, 2011, except nobody was, was interested in making the equipment. <laughs> Walter back there is laughing. Uh, so then we had to go and we got um, Dr. Pan, who's a legislature to help say, no, push it back to implementation to 2014, but guess what? They weren't making the equipment yet then either. So then we had to go back to the well a third time and ask, could you change the law so it doesn't kick in for another two years because they're not ready. So it's supposed to take it, but well, the law took effect for January 1, and then I, nobody was ready. They're getting close to being ready, but they're not ready. And I had to write a letter to the Department of Health, which is easier than going back to the legislature and saying, oh, well, please don't enforce this because nobody can comply. Um, stuff won't be ready till later in the year. So, I mean, the, the, the Department of Health was very reasonable about that, but here's an, uh, that's an example, a prototype. Uh, I know you can't, comp I didn't have two side by side to connect it, so um, that's hard to tell. I don't know if you can see that the um, needle cap on the left looks a little different than the one on the right. So that's 20% smaller diameter, so it's gonna be really hard to tell. Um, at least the manufacturers got together, they formed an organization, Getza, you know, they kind of trademarked their NR fit thing, but you know, that you have to make the hub, you have to change infusion tubing, syringes and needles. And it's not just they're making it. What are you gonna do if you have a crash C-section? Now you're gonna have to have syringes everywhere, you have to have the needles everywhere because the syringe needle combination is going to work. You have to have it stocked everywhere. It's a whole supply chain. Hospital policies have to be changed. It's a big deal. It's not as simple as saying, well, if you change the little connector thing, um, you're going to avoid a few medication errors per year. Uh, same thing with the spinal tray or epidural tray, right? Do you, if it leaves your hand, you have to label it. That, that seems logical from a, perhaps a regulatory or legislative perspective, but we know that's more complicated. ASA House of Delegates in 20, 2010 said, oh, there, you know, there's no data to support that. If you don't break your sterile field, there's no, no way you can do harm. And Joint Commission didn't care. Uh, and then they reaffirmed it in 2015, but with data. So, right, NACOR, um, there were no cases reported out of 4 million anesthetics of problems, closed claims, anesthesia reporting system, zero. So <clears throat> are you ABA certified? Anybody? All right. We'll see. So in this case, I define it as always be advocating. So when you go back, back to work, right, you're advocating at the level of your hospital for some reasonable practices you know, on behalf of your patients, but also to let you focus on your patients. So everyone thinks, oh, the policies, because someone smart looked at it from a national level, and it's a top down. But what I found over the years is a lot of stuff happens is the bottom up. It's what I call the micro determining the macro, where, okay, yeah, I don't want to be bothered. I'll, the GI guys want to give the propofol. I can't cover it. It's a hassle. Yeah. I'll, let the, I'll sign off and let the, them give the propofol. Well, that, that may not be, I understand the, the need and the pressure to succumb to that, but that doesn't make good policy. Once you do it here, then they want to do it, and then everybody's doing it, and now you've de facto changed it. So what you do, what all of you do, it doesn't matter what I say, what all of you do determines standard of care. Right? We use drugs every day, um, like a neuraxial fentanyl. That was never FDA approved, right? They don't want to spend the money to do it on a generic drug, or a lot of times in our field, obstetric anesthesia, they don't want to 
incur the additional liability by going through the FDA approval process. So I'd say advocacy matters. You know, it's not just at DC or Sacramento, um, but at your hospital with every patient. Report issues to your state society. We can help you. Um, and I encourage you to all be, always be advocating certified. And just think about what you do, not just in terms of your micro, but what it means if everyone else across the country were to start to do that. Uh, before they fixed the Capitol Dome, I got to um, get a tour, a, a nice view. Uh, that's Dr. Pan, actually, at a recent CSA meeting. He helped us out with one of those extensions on the epidural connector. And I leave you with warm, loving thoughts. Thank you very much. <laughs>